have as well people from Costa Rica today. So really, really happy to see all around the world people joining our meetup. Uh, as mentioned, the meetup itself will be recorded so that you can find it afterwards in the Teams. I will also show how you can get access to the Teams channel. Uh, today, what we're going to present is, as usual, I, I will show the what's new section in Power BI, uh, what, uh, so what happened in the last few weeks since our last meetup. Then afterwards, I go and hand over to Bernard, who will show us the time intelligence in a few clicks. And Nicola will take afterwards uh, his presentation from Excel to S, so reduce your Power BI model size by 90%. Just to um, to make you aware of it as well, we have uh, two other groups here in Switzerland, one in Geneva, Lausanne located, who is driven by Anne. And if you're interested in joining that meetup as well, feel free to contact her. I added the email address here in the hyperlink. Same goes for St. Gallen, where Rune Lechner is uh, the in lead over there. Uh, they also had already four meetups in the, up, uh, in the last few months and, and years. And the next one will be in January, where I will also present a little bit what happened in the Power BI world. So let me show you first, before I start with the What's New section, how you can get access to Teams. Um, as you see and probably know now by now is what we do, uh, we have a Teams channel. In this Teams channel, we organize our calls. I also uh, save the recordings in there. You can find the presentations so the previous presentation from mostly all meetups and so on. So therefore, I highly recommend to, to join it. And how to do so? Uh, you have to request it. This is the link to, uh, to, to request access. You will get a forms where you have to provide your uh, name and email address and say yes, that you wish to participate. This is more like a data privacy thing. Uh, I have to do that as a Microsofty, but no worries. I'm not collecting your email address to send you some marketing or stuff. It's really just to make sure that I can add you to the Teams. Once in Teams, what you can do is at the top right corner, you can switch the so-called tenant. Let me show that. I'm here in my demo environment and have to log in. Give me a sec. My password is wrong. Okay. Then let me show it in Teams directly. Give me a sec. <coughs> okay. So if you're in Teams, you have the possibility at the top right corner to click on your uh, on on your tenant name, which is Microsoft in my case. And in your case, I guess your company name, you can click on it and really switch the tenant to uh, to which you have access to then. And this one would be Microsoft. So if I switch one more time back to, to the slides, you can see you will have like a Microsoft guest tenant. Once you switched, you will have a Teams called Power BI User Group Switzerland. Within you will have a general channel and there you can find the posts. You can go at the top over here and find the files. And within the files, as mentioned, uh, there are all the recordings that we have, all the files from the previous meetup. So if you're interested in, feel free to go through it and, and, and look it or watch it again and, and, and use the, the slides. Further, we have the upcoming events. So this is the calendar at the end. We have an FAQ, who we are, what we do and so on. And we have the Power BI Meets Up site embedded. All right, just to make you aware of, um, if you request uh, to join the teams, please be a little bit uh, patient. I have to add you afterwards. It takes probably sometimes a day or two so that you know you're not immediately in the teams itself. All right, any questions to that? Doesn't look like. And can I please ask you to, to uh, use yourself? Thanks. All right, then let's move on with the what's new section in Power BI. And um, here is a little overview of what I'm going to present. Uh, so, a colleague of mine, Andrea Janici, VH, she's a cloud solution architect here at Microsoft. She wrote a Power Query cookbook. This will be uh, published next week on Friday. I had the pleasure to, to read it already, and it's a really great book for all beginners who, who wish to understand what Power Query is. Um, 
I also made a slide for that. This is uh, how the book looks like. Uh, you can go directly to this link, which is an Amazon link. And if you're interested in starting from next week, you can even go and get it if you wish to do so. And, uh, what kind of updates we have uh, for the Power BI Embedded Analytics Playground? We embedded it, uh, we are updated it a little bit, which means you can now test your own reports with your own token. So uh, till now you had to log in, uh, but you couldn't use your own token. And since a few weeks now, you can even use your own token if you wish to do so. And it supports as well multiple different languages. So let me show you how that looks like. If I go to the playground, first of all, if you wish to try the developer sandbox, you can say try it. And you see till now you had sample, and you could use or select your own report. And the new feature is to embed it really with your own token. And so you can really test, for example, row level security with different tokens if you wish to do so. And for the multi language support, you would need to scroll down. And you have here at the bottom over here, your English. You can select another language and see how the user interface will switch and then do it in, in German, Espanol, or whatever you wish. All right, this was a small and quick one. Moving on to insights. Um, Power BI has had insights for a long time, but with this new, let's call it update or feature, it changed a little bit what insight does. Till now you could get to the data set, for example, or to, to a, a specific, um, to a specific uh, visual and say get insights and you will be provided to a next page uh, to a next report and it will show you some insights that it found but we improved this experience and now you will get within the report on the right hand side a panel which will show you different kind of insights for trends for anomalies and as well for kpis and once you click on it it will even show you uh, of what these anomalies for example or the kpi analysis is based on this feature requires premium or a premium per user workspace. And if you have a premium per user license, you can get insight as well in non-premium workspaces. A little bit complicated, I know, but at the end, if you have premium or premium per user, you can use this feature. And how it looks like, let me show that as well. If I go here to Power BI, if I go here to my sales and return sample, this sample is coming from, from the PG. Probably some of you will recognize it. But once loaded, at the top now that I have this button Get Insights. And what I can do is I can click on it. And on the right hand side, it will show me the insight that it finds. In my case, it's a KPI analysis, so there is no anomalies that it, that it detected. But what I can do is I see here is Overall net sales is currently at 387. The net sales for product ID 16 and product 16 are significantly higher and so on. And if I click on it, I will get a deeper analysis on this KPI analysis. So I really have some nice visuals explaining me what exactly is found and what exactly is meant. One little thing to make you aware of, what I found is, um, give me a sec to see where exactly it is. Here it is. If I do the insights, for example, on a page where I work with bookmarks and hide and hide visuals, the insight still works on all visuals. So, for example, now I it found an anomaly, and if I hover over with my mouse, non-visual is detected, and you can see that recent anomaly in exit prof extra profit. This is the visual it found it. And to, to get to this visual, in my case, I would need to, to click here this button, extra profit to switch the visual or to unhide and hide it. And now it will show up uh, or highlight my visual from where this anomaly is coming from. Just wanted to make you aware of this, that even if you work with bookmarks, hide and unhide, the insight works for every visual, but you have to, if you wish to be uh, that it's highlighted, you have to make it visible, of course. Any questions so far? I see a hand raised. Yes, please. So I have a quick question. 
So in the past, when I tried to get inside working, um, uh, it it had problems working properly. Is there a guide how to make uh, my measures in a way that it will work properly with insights? Is there some some kind of things on this? Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. Um, I'm not sure if there is a documentation. I'm not aware of it that we have like a best practice for insights. But what I can do is I can check and see if I find something. And if so, I can post it then in Teams as well. Or I don't know, Dennis or anyone else, if you have any comments, please feel free. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, best practices for insights. Yeah, just took a note. We'll check that. All right. Uh, any further questions? Does it look like? Then I move on to the next slide. Not going into presenter mode. It's an easy one. There is a new option for um, line visuals. So till now um, you had always this option to to have categories at the top, but now you have these serious labels, which will give you the possibility to have the line labeled at the right hand or left hand side. And how that works is well, pretty easy. Let me open Power BI Desktop. I have here a line chart. And if I now add, for example, a country to the legend, as you see, I have the legend and um, the labels at the top. But now if I go to Format tab and click here on for the series label, make it a little bit bigger, uh, we can see that the countries now are, are representing each line and I can find it easier which one is Switzerland, which one is Germany, which one is Brazil and so on and so on. And of course it can be uh, configured. So instead of right, I can put it on the left hand side, for example, I can configure the font size, uh, I can configure uh, background, word wrap and so on and so on. Just a nice little feature over here um, that will make the line chart a little bit more handy for end users. Moving back uh, to the slide, the next feature is Power BI Goals Automated Status Rules. So for those who are familiar or already working with Power BI Goals, um, this is a new artifact, let's say, where you can define uh, goals and the status and you can comment on it and, and make uh, checkings and so on. But in now, the status itself had always be, uh, you had to manually update it uh, to say, is it on track, is it behind, at risk and so on. But now you can do the status update automatically based on your data. And how that looks like, let me switch one more time here to my Power BI. And I have here a scorecard prepared. And if I go to edit mode, I have here, for example, plan new meetup budget for 2023. And if I say edit this goal, we see that the current this is uh, connected to a Power BI data point. So, so really the data is coming from a Power BI report. I see that because it's grayed out. And my target is hard coded. So I can type in here whatever I wish to, to have a target, or I can also say connect to, to a specific data point. In my case, let's uh, let it be 120,000 like it was. And I have here now the status. And if I go to update rules, we see that we are now in the status rules. And what I did is I already created two rules saying if my value is less than 100K, the status should be at risk. If my value is less than or equal 120K, it's behind and everything else is on track. So this means if I update my data set and the value of 99K will change to, let's say, 120K, it will be then. 120K will be behind. If it's above 120, it will be on track in this case. And the rules itself are pretty easy to, to define. I can just click here, say new rule. If I say if value is greater than equals less than whatever, I can type in here um, uh, my, my number I wish, or I can also type in the percentage of, of my target. So if my target is 120K, and if it reaches, for example, 50% of it, so which would be 60K in this case, uh, I can change the status to whatever, let's say 
completed, which doesn't make sense, but at least you, you, you have this possibility to do so. And what you can do, you can also add multiple conditions and say, not only my value, but you can also reference to an other uh, dimension within, within the goals or within the report. In my case, I have three value, date, and value change. And so for example, if I say date, and if the date is on or after, for example, the sixth, and say safe, um, the status should be changed because uh, today is, is after the date and the value is greater than 50%, so the status should be then uh, completed. And if I click on it, if I say safe, I think I have to update, right? Let me check. <coughs> uh, ah, I did one, one thing wrong. Let me let me show you. Um, it's going from from the top to the bottom, which means because my value is less than 100k, it's automatically at risk. Which means I would need to put my uh, my my rule at the top to make it as first rule. And if I save now, I hope now it should work. Otherwise, save. Yeah, now it worked, and you see my status change automatically to completed. We have one question, Christian, from yes, Ignacio. Mm -hmm. Hello, Christian. Thanks. Hi, Ignacio. Hi. Um, uh, this is a great feature. Uh, my question is: uh, Can we set the target uh, as a parameter or as some dynamic value? Um, what you can do is. Uh, you can connect to your data. So you can connect to a report and within this report, if it's, it's, it's dynamic, it will also change then the target, of course, by every refresh of the data set. Ah, okay. So I could choose a, a value from a column from my report, for example. Yes, yes. Ah, you can awesome. That. That's awesome. Thanks a lot. Great, great feature. Sure. Great to hear. <laughs> Any other question? All right, doesn't look like. Let me then switch back to my presentation. I have two more things over here. Uh, one is the new admin API. Uh, we have a new uh, API call which allows you to um, to see what uh, um, to what a user has access to. So, which means, for example, imagine you're leaving the company and the admin. Uh, um, would like to know now to what kind of artifacts in Power BI you had access to. And with this API call, uh, he can provide a graph ID of the user and will get in return all the artifacts of so Power BI reports, paginated reports, dashboards, apps, and so on, and see to what kind of uh, to what kind of artifacts you had what kind of access. It's not working only with the user graph ID. You can also uh, use guest users, distribution group, security group or an M365 group graph ID to do so. And lastly, we are now general available with the premium platform since uh, three days now. And this is really a big step forward. And of course, it shouldn't be Star Trek next generation. It's Power BI Premium next generation. And with it, just to make you aware of it, uh, the auto scale will now charge. So this means if you're using auto scale in your organization, um, it will beginning, uh, the charging will begin by the 4th of November. So next month, please make sure uh, to, to configure it right if you wish to, to use it uh, afterwards or to, to turn it off if you, don't, uh, if you don't wish to use it at all while it's charging. Any questions so far? Right, then as lastly, last slide from my side. Oh, there is a question. Yes, Ignacio. Uh, yes, please, one question. Uh, the, the new platform, mm -hmm. uh, it's the premium Gen 2 platform? Yes, yes. Okay, and uh, for example, all workspaces uh, generation one must be migrated to version two, right? Before moving. 
Um, as far as I know, yes, because you had these classical workspaces uh, that, that we introduced at the beginning, and since what is it, yeah. one and a half years, we have now this upgraded version. And yes, <laughs> we highly recommend to to upgrade the workspace and then move to Gen two. Okay, okay, perfect, perfect, perfect. Does anybody do you know what people are have already migrated to generation two? Uh, yes, I, I do know there are some customers who, who tested it even in the preview phase and, and moved some kind of workloads to the Gen 2, and I didn't hear any issues in the last months. I know at the beginning, uh, when we introduced Gen 2, they, be, they have been some issues with data flows, but we moved that, uh, I think, after a month or two already. Perfect. Thanks. Sure. All right, then, as mentioned, last slide. Uh, if you wish to keep up to date with the Power BI features, um, there are two great links. The first one is, of course, the release plan, which will, uh, which is updated every half hour, uh, not hour, uh, every half year, in April and in uh, October. Or the other way is, if you uh, wish, you can also click the first link over here and check out the report, which is based on the release plan <coughs> to see what kind of features are introduced and will come into the uh, in the upcoming months. And with that, thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to hand over to Bernard and his presentation about time intelligence in a few clicks. Um, we agreed that a question should be asked at the end, so if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, and we will handle them at the end. All right, thanks very much, and yeah, good luck, Bernard. <laughs> You're still on mute, we can't hear you. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, and hello, everyone. Now, okay, so let me share my screen very quickly. There we go. And this was here. All right, no, that's here it is. Okay, it goes. Now, today, um, I put this first this title, the time intelligence, in a few clicks, but uh, it's going to work uh, quite of an introduction to calculation groups, and I hope you enjoy it. So, short introduction by myself. I'm a senior BI developer at this Marina. It's a small consultancy based in Barcelona, where I'm from. And uh, well, as you, if you know me from the social networks, I'm uh, very passionate about Power BI, DAX, and I would say, and calculation groups. <laughs> I come from Excel and Visual Basic and, uh, well, and from industrial engineering. So, calculation groups are powerful, yeah. but don't take my word for it. So, I put up a PBIX where you can see some applications very quickly. We're not going to go deep on this. It's just to see that what is possible with calculation groups. So, first and foremost, for example, if you want to have like different calculations without creating new measures. Here you can see, well, I just copied from here, but this is, has like only five measures, but for them, I, I get like two calculations, like for current year and previous year. This is live, huh? so if I move to 2009, then I get the values, yeah? Here for previous year, you see it's 115462. 115462. So th it is actually working, a very important thing. And of course, I could filter for all other things. Also, here are the calculations I'm using current year and previous year, but it could be like year to date and previous year to date. Well, since I'm not filtering by month, this doesn't really have any big effect. But like we also have like year over year and all the other things. Uh, notice that uh, together with the calculations, I'm also having like different format strings. So we'll get into that as well. Build it like this. Now, what else? What can we do? You can really like modify your model with a click. So here uh, you see this is a screenshot of the model, and we have two relationships between date and the sales. It, one is like the order date is the active relationship, and we have an, an active relationship that goes to the delivery date. So, and depending on your use case, you might want to switch from one to the other, and then. Um, Normally, you would have to redo all your measures using the calculate, use relationship, and so on. But here now I have my measures here with uh, my order date. But if I click here, uh, it's returning me 
the value as if the delivery date was the active relationship. So very cool. Now, what else? This is a bit more niche, but I think it's also interesting. This is a recent thing that I found at work and I published in my blog. Here, we're having a weird case of uh, matrix filtering. So um, here I added a, a measure filter and I say, OK, when this is yes, then show because there are some rows I don't want to see. And this, this is a very basic. Uh, wait, let me see if I can show you. Where is it? Um, with sales, where is the measure? With sales is, is a very, very easy. So it, it looks if there's empty on the fact table is empty, then no. Otherwise, yes. So I only want to see rows that have data from the fact table. And then for some reason, this is this is blank, but it should not be. You see, if I remove this measure, I'm getting values. Yeah, for all those that have like sales amount, I get a forecast value as well. The thing is that I have some rows that should not be there because uh, this is, well, this is just a, some stupid measure, but uh, really there is no values coming from the fact table. So I want to hide this and this should work, but it doesn't. Yeah, there's a strange, a relationship if I remove CD then it works if I put it it doesn't though what I want to show you is that if we use a calculation group called visibility that I have over here and I say only with sales it works perfectly so I think circle BI has also made a couple of videos about this and then they go into the performance analyzer DAX and find the exception and then they come around with a solution for the measure so it doesn't happen like that I think this approach is very safe. I mean, I think it works very well. And and maybe if you don't want to fight with all these strange decks that comes of performance analyzer, and which can change over time because there's no guarantee that it will stay like that, then I think this approach is very good as well. Now, more weird stuff. Maybe the first one is basically what you want. Maybe the second. This is a bit niche. Now we're getting to the more fancy stuff. You can make the columns of your metrics the same with a calculation group. <laughs> Isn't that great? Here, it's it's not in any effect. But say, OK, but I want use. Boom. Now the columns are the same width, but I can like change it to whatever I like. And even make it, I just only, I want them to be the same width, but only the, the width I need for the largest number. So if I put auto, this works. And how I know, if I show, for example, only customer two, you see the column is much narrower. But when I put both, now two is wider because one is there as well. So that's that's cool. I don't know if I, <laughs> I don't know. I came out with this solution and, and I think it's very interesting. And now it's a even weirder effect. You see, I have this beautiful image and with a chart in which uh, I conditionally I made some conditional format, but just pointing to a measure with this value. OK, this is uh, just a color one. Color one, which uh, well, it reads from the from the JSON and so on. But at the end, it's a table, right? So and, and it's just exactly this, this number. Now I can change this color with a calculation group on the fly. So I can make this blue a little lighter, which is very nice if I want to. <laughs> but I also I can make it more trend. Oh, sorry, this is too light. I can make it. Wait, I can make it transparent as well, which is also very nice. Problem is that conditional formatting only works as long as you don't put uh, any other legend, so to say. If I put the, if it's a stock chart and I have like two or more categories, I cannot use conditional formatting anymore. So the use cases are very limited. And even though I'm very proud of this, I, I cannot, I haven't found a real use case for it. But still, it's something that can be done. And maybe at some point, uh, the, the UI will allow you to use it in more settings. OK, so you have a very quick overlook on what can you do with calculation groups. So let's go back to the theory. What are calculation groups? OK, so a couple of definitions. The short one is like tax expressions that replace the measures in present in their scope. OK, 
This one is from Ken Snyder with some modifications. It's a set of one or more DAX expressions called calculation items, represented as rows in a column that can be applied through the filter context of a report and have a default behavior of replacing any measure. And I added value and form a string that exists in the filter context created by the calculation item. This will become much easier when we see it. I, I like this image. I mean, for most use cases, you can think of them, them, sorry, as a jacket for your measures. Okay. So you have your measure and then you put like a calculate around it. But this calculate, you write it somewhere else. And then you just put the two things together. You get your measure and then you get your jacket and you have boom, you have like previous year value or stuff like this. Okay. Now, why do we need calculation groups? Well, I show you a few examples already, and uh, I there's a still even you can set the default value in slicers dynamically, which is even a SQL BI made a video on that. But you can use it even like to set like current month. If nothing is selected, show current month. If something is selected, show what is selected. This is a very cool behavior as well. Oh, sorry. And uh, yeah. Okay. So how do we build calculation groups? Well, we use them in Tableau Editor. Basically, you cannot create them through the Power BI desktop interface. You could theoretically um, build them with Visual Studio. I don't know anybody who does that, but I think it's possible. And um, and this is available since last year. Yeah. So some people might be worried, but because I said that I would replace the measures, huh? and it's true. But the good news is that we have some special functions that allow you to re return <laughs> to what you have. So whatever you use, select a measure, it's like a placeholder that will take the measure that is actually in the scope and put it in your expression. So if you don't put anything and just put selected measure, then you do nothing. But from there, you can build whatever you want. Selected measure plus one, if you want, uh, anything. Then, as you can imagine, there is a thing, yeah? because calculation groups replace all the measures in the scope, all of them. So you have a dynamic title, which is a measure, and you put a object level filter with, uh, of a calculation group. This will also work on the title measure, okay? And then if you're doing a year over year calculation, then it will try, it will try to subtract title from the title, and then the whole visual will break. So you need to be careful how calculation groups work and make sure that it only apply on the measures that you want. So in order to decide whether or not you should do these transformations, there are some functions and uh, you have two options actually, which is selected measure name and is selected measure. So this will return you the name of the measure and then you check whatever it is. And is selected measure, you just pass the measure as an argument and it will return true or false. Now, in the same way that uh, you can use selected measure to return the measure that you have, you can also do the same for the format string. Yeah. So if you don't want to find the format string or whatever comes out of your calculation group, you just uh, you go to the format expression and you say, OK, select a measure format string. Just as it comes, turn it. But you can do other things. So for instance, uh, you'll well, we'll say that for most uh, year uh, time intelligence calculations, you just want to keep the same format string that comes. But if you're doing a year over year percent, then you want to modify it. So and then, but only modify it if it's one of affected measures. So that's why you'll need uh, the ability to return the original format string as well. OK. Moving on, now how do we use calculation groups? Well, because we define them, but how can we use them in the in the report? It's like any other filter, which is crazy. No? So you can, if you put it in a matrix, then whatever it's in the row will be affected by the calculation. Also, you can put them in the filter panel, at the visual level, page level, whatever, or even within DAX expressions. So you put uh, calculate and your measure, and then say, OK, from my calculation group and the calculation item equals blah, blah, blah. Then this calculation item will be applied to that measure. Okay, and will return and then will become another measure. I 
recommend personally not mixing one with the others. <laughs> Either you do these or you do the other ones, but both together it gets complicated. Anyway, there are some ground rules as well. You can only have one calculation item per, per calculation group applied to the scope. Otherwise, not is applied. Okay, if you go to a page level and you apply two calculation items, it's the same as you didn't do anything because Power BI doesn't know what to do with it. But if inside that page you have a metric and then you put the calculation column, the calculation item column in a, it's like in the row section or in the column section, then the measures that are in, inside will be either affected by one or the other, then it's okay. Yeah, just that the, the, in one, when the measure is evaluated, only one calculation item from each calculation group can be active. Yeah, you can have several, but from different calculation groups. Now, this should not be an issue because we know that implicit measures are no good. But once a calculation group is created, implicit measures cannot be created anymore. So if you had some already placed in a visual, they would continue to work. But uh, you'll see that you cannot, you know, drag and drop any uh, more value columns into any visual as a as a value. Uh, and you will all the signs of you know of uh, the sigma sign and all those will also disappear from the model but then again it's it's a, maybe it's a, it's a feature it's a good practice not to use implicit measures anyway now this i felt into the trap sometimes because the calculation groups look like a function almost huh? you put something and then you get something in return but they only work on measures yeah you cannot pass a variable or even a calculate expression inside. It doesn't work. You only can put a measure, OK? Otherwise, it does nothing. OK, so we shall see a use case. This is the time intelligence, and that's why the title was time intelligence in a few clicks. So normally, time intelligence, if you just go the measure way, it can be time consuming. Right. So here we have like just four measures, but if you want all these time intelligence calculations for each of them, then you it's kind of it's not exponential, but <laughs> it's a very high uh, steep number of of measures very quickly. So from this sort of approach, we'll get to this one, which is much more nicer, and uh, it's, it's very nice because if you decide to change the way you do year over year calculation, you do it in one place, and well. There's all sorts of good things out of it. So let's do it. I'll close this one just in case I get out of memory. I'll save it. And um, and let's move to this other one. So here I already have all this huge list of measures. And uh, well, and here we have for several uh, several months and so on. But uh, let's simplify. We'll just work with one of them. Sales amount. So you maybe, I don't know, I've seen all sorts of uh, drama stories of how people do uh, time intelligence. You should always have a date table marked as a, as a date table. OK, so you should do always do that. OK, very good. And then uh, we use the functions for time intelligence, right? So for previous year, this is what Microsoft tell you to like so calculate, same period as year, date. OK, beautiful. This has some caveat, so to say. If I use this measure here, it works nice, you see, because for January 2008, for previous year, I'm getting the the value that for January 2007. So, okay, beautiful. That's very nice. Just be aware that you get this as well. So, if your calendar has future dates, you'll get the previous year value, even though you don't have current year value. Something to be aware of. So, of course, you can hide it in many ways, but uh, there's better definitions of previous year, a bit more sophisticated, that will prevent from these values from appearing, and we'll see how to use them, okay? 
What I want to show you is, but first things first, we're, we want to create a calculation group. Huh? So let's imagine that you have uh, one measure, then you come up with some expression. It's like, wow, this is so cool. I want to apply this same transformation to a number of measures that I have. Okay, how can we do that? So this is important. Um, you can do the same things in Tumblr Editor 2 and 3. Okay, I like working with three, but maybe not everybody has it. So I'll show you one approach to do it in Tumblr Editor 2. Okay, so I'll just open it real fast. Okay, here I have uh, well, uh, unsupported features enabled for what we're doing is not necessary. So my approach, if I work with Tumblr Editor 2, uh, you already well. You, if you work with it, you already know that it has no IntelliSense, so it's very tough to write things on Tumblr Editor through it, uh, too, because you get no help. So, but anyway, you open the model with Tumblr Editor, and then you create a new calculation group, which is here. Very good. And then I would call that like simple time intelligence. Okay. Very good. Then, um, wait. Uh, also, each calculation group is like a table that has a column. By default, the name of the column is name. Please change that. I always use the same name of the calculation group. Intelligence. It's easier to understand. And then you have to create the different calculation items, which will be the rows of that table. Okay, they have a name. So here for current year, we'll just use the same. Okay. So in this case, selected measure. Okay. Here you see the property. This is the value expression, but they have the formatting expression. Here, if you leave it empty, normally it's no big issue. I would recommend you to complete it. Selected measure format string, super long name. Okay. This would be our first. But since we are here, let's do another one. Eh? And this would be like previous year. Very good. And then uh, we would go, what we would do, yeah? Here is what I'm, my proposal is, just go and you copy the transformation that you already have, and you type it here, okay? And the thing is that you want to, this to work with any measure that you put there. So you would just remove this and put select the measure. And this works. And here we'll select the measure format string. This is not really needed, but I think it's good. Yes. Okay. So what happened? When we say back to the puzzle, you'll see this yellow banner, but this is every time you create a new calculation group or even a new calculation item, you'll get this warning. What is? But then boom, then you have your your calculation group here. If you go and have a look, it's just you see a table, and here we didn't set the order in which they should come, so there's just minus one. But we can say no, I want first this and this, and then this will change. Let's see, does this work? Let's try it. So, if we copy this, can I copy that? Okay, we come here. Now I'll change that to wait. Your month. I'll make this a matrix. I'll put the month back here. Okay, and now what I'll do is I'll bring this column, which contains all the calculations. Wait. Nothing wrong. And we'll put the so what is it? The sales amount, for instance, here. Okay, very nice. Okay, is it a little bit too big? But anyway. You see that indeed it is working. Yeah. So I'm getting the value. And I also am getting the same problem that I had. So I'm getting the same thing. <laughs> but now I it's a it's a column. So uh, I'm if I had more measures, for instance, if I'm not interested in having this here and I put another measure, 
for example, margin, I can put the margin here and then go to, where is it? Values and turn on as rows. And this is already very cool. So you can have a list of measures with the current year and the previous year value. Even if I had the measures created, which I have, <laughs> it doesn't would be any easy to put the, the values like that, right? So anyway, uh, this is pretty cool. But can we do any better? Of course we can. Um, as I was saying, there's like some, because this takes time and also the definitions, maybe can we improve? There is a website, which is awesome, which is called DAXPatterns.com, where the guys from SQL BI have fought with all sorts of problems and came up with a very good solutions to all of them. So I said, well, these calculations groups can help me do this that, and they did the great definitions. Why if we bring this two together? So that's what I did. And um, let's do that. You can do that with Tabular Editor 2 as well. So where is it? Here we go to advanced scripting. I mean, the, the, you have to download, of course, the, the script. Um, I'll, I'll share the link. Where is it? Uh, da, 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 sorry about that. <laughs> now looking at the wrong place. Ah, uh, wait, wait. I remember GitHub, of course. And then we have time intelligence. And here we have the time intelligence. Here in Tabular Editor, this applies not just to calculation group, but to anything. You can like script things out. And previously you had like to configure some parameters. Now you don't. You can actually save that as a macro if you want. Or custom action is called here. And this is uh, called like time intelligence or whatever. And then you say, okay, this is a model thing because it doesn't really apply to any to anything in particular. Okay, so now I would go just to my model, or I don't know. And here is screen, well, no, custom action, sorry. Time intelligence. Ah, no measures affected by the car group. Okay, this is one thing you have to decide. Which measures do you want to uh, affect it? Yeah, so here I would say the measure I want affected is the margin, margin percentage, and uh, say, what is the other sales? Where is the sales? Sales amount? Hmm? Ah, sales amount here. Okay. Then I run again the, the script. Oh, it doesn't work like this. Can I make this crazy? Ah, this is complicated. And now, creating. No, but it doesn't work like that. That's that. Um, okay. Uh, here, well, you can you can execute it like this. Maybe this is, doesn't work that nice. Let me just open it real quick with Tabular Editor three because I don't think you have that problem over there. Of you know applying here, I'll do that the, the trick that the trick data on Gaia in a cube with that same script. Okay, this is pretty much the same thing with. Nicer. So here, you see now I have this calculation group already in my toolbar, and then I can use both. So this is margin, margin percentage, sales amount, and uh, that's about it. And uh, total cost. Well, just leave one out, and then then you click here, boom. And that's okay. What's the name that you want? Time intelligence is fine. Okay, this is the column. Let's call it the same. Then this will create a, a table which will contain the names of the affected measures. And we'll see a minute why is this so cool. And then the column is called measure. Okay, your fact table, sales. Okay. What's the main date column of that table? Is the order date. Okay. What's your date table? Is date. And the date is stored in the date column. And the year is here. This is for the dynamic labels that you use earlier. Okay, so it's done. Here we have already our calculation group. So we say back to the model. And now we should have the time intelligence, the big one. Okay. Now, 
we move to the second. Now here, let's we have a metric which sells amount, but I, if I add now the time intelligence here at the top, you see I already have all the calculations, so I don't have to type anything. They're already done, they work, even the format string is correct, which is nice. And here I can put it as a filter as well. Okay, so if I put like previous year or year over year on this thing, this is also very nice. I got some weird thing. I mean, in theory, I could put like the 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 value, the dynamic title here inside. Sometimes I get strange. Oh, sorry, no, no, that's not what I wanted to do. If I add a card and I put this measure inside. This will show me exactly what's the label for this calculation. So I'm doing previous year with 2009 selected, it would return me 2008. If I'm doing year over year, this is 2009 versus 2008. You can put whoopah, you can put that as a title or something. Okay. And uh, and that is pretty cool. Um, one use case I didn't show today, but uh, doing uh, with um, you can also hide some of the data labels leave just the last one if you want and then use the dynamic label because this you cannot do even with the update that we just saw because this is a this is a measure so in in if you use the new feature you'll you'll get a euro over year you know why over why but if you want to do that you, you'll have to go the other way anyway um Okay, yeah, I, I want to talk about the, the calculated table that is hidden here. You see, now I have a calculated table that has the names of the measures, but how does this work? So if we have a look at the calculation items of the new calculation group, for example, for year over year, you see here what it does, first checks which is the measure that is inside. Of the scope. So it starts to say, okay, what selected measure name? And then if selected measure name is in values of this table, then it does one thing. Then, well, it has a, another case, which is the special, which is the label as value measure for the dynamic label, then does something else. And at the end, if it's neither of these two cases, it returns a measure. So if you have any other measure created over there, then it will do nothing. So for instance, if I'm getting, okay, very quick. Uh, so I have a matrix and I put my time intelligence over here and then I put my measures. So I put all of them here, margin, sales amount, total cost, margin percentage. And I put them as rows, values, or is it rows? Okay. If you realize, look at the total cost. Total cost stays the same. It's not doing the trick. Yeah. Okay, but normally, if you do it, uh, well, the, the most uh, normal approach would be like, you know, to, to add them in the calculation items. If I put here like a list or I, or I include like each selected measure and I put the measures there, then I would have to go to each of those calculation items and add the total cost, total cost, total cost, total cost. But not just one, but twice, because with the format string expression happens the same thing. So I would have to go here, total cost, total cost. So I would have to do like 16 times this operation, which is not nice, right? So instead, since I have the list centralized here, I can just come here and say total cost. And here it is. And then total cost is doing the trick now. Isn't this nice? Okay, so this is more or less what I wanted to, to talk. There's just one little thing I want to discuss with you before finishing my presentation. And that's what happens when you have one more than one calculation group. Yeah, because I said that you can use one item from each calculation group. Well, calculations groups have a property which is called calculation group precedence, and it's just a number. Okay, so here, this is what the SQL BI says: they are applied by decreasing precedence number. 
but I find myself it's easier to remember that. So higher presence means further out in the expression. You were talking about jackets, so imagine that you wear several jackets. So higher precedent would be like the out, the jacket that is outside, <laughs> and the lowest would be the jacket that is inside. And then inside you still have the measure. Yeah? But so the outer calculation group will affect any measures that are included inside the, the lower calculation groups. So here, if this has precedence two and precedence one, then this is what you get. So this dates. The precedence two one is outside and the precedence one becomes inside the other one. OK, but this is complicated. So just some good practices when using calculation groups. Keep it simple yeah? because you don't really get to see the final text that is evaluated. So when things go all right, then it's like, mm, I don't know. So do step by step. Keep it simple. Limit the scope, yeah. So this if selected measure, ta 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 ta, ta because otherwise you might get into problems. And then, as I always said before, stay away from mixing measures defined with calculation groups and calculation groups in the filter context, yeah. Because what happens if your measure has like one precedence, but you're adding another one which has a higher or lower precedence? Very difficult to understand what's going to happen. So stay away from doing that. <laughs> And then there is well something we didn't really talk about, but it's like uh, when you're defining a calculation item, in theory, you could use a calculate expression using another calculation item of the same calculation group. Yeah, so say my new calculation item is calculate, selected measure, and then using this other calculation item. Theoretically, you can do that, but it's limited and it's better not to get into that because it's called sideways recursion. Uh, when I was preparing this script, then uh, I presented the first version, which was using that, and they said, well, maybe you should avoid that. So the, the script now doesn't have it. And I think with this, I finished my presentation here. You have all the contact. Please connect with me on Twitter. And uh, here you have the GitHub. And very glad if you read the blog, because you'll find uh, there is a Time intelligence, the smart way is the, the the blog post in which I talk about this script, and you also have the link directly to the to the script from there. But well, here in the in the GitHub, I'm sure you'll find it. And I have a few videos on YouTube, but very few. <laughs> That's pretty much it. I would really like to hear your questions and 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 see if you're interested into trying out calculation groups. You see, the potential is huge. And the learning curve is not that bad. I would say it's worse with charts later. <laughs> what do you think? Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, so let's give people a few more seconds if they wish to ask something. <laughs> looks like everything is clear <laughs> from well, my point of view really really great thank you very much i mean uh, i'm familiar with calculation groups already and i see really the potential especially if you're if you're working with large data models that you not to have to repeat the calculations and so on you just create a calculation group and there you go really great mm -hmm. glad yeah thank you very much for now one more okay. time and then with that i would say uh nicola it's your turn Okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, thanks, Bernard. It was a great presentation. Thank you. And, uh, Christian, should I start immediately or? Yes, please. You can do so. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Let me just uh, share my screen. Good luck now after that. <laughs> thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so. Hopefully you can see it. OK, so uh, yeah, hi everybody. As you already mentioned, good morning, good afternoon or good evening when we are doing this uh, virtual events. So we are not sure uh, from which part of the world people are joining. So I'm always uh, wishing good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, first of all, I'm happy to be here and uh, thanks to Christian and Dennis for giving me a chance to present for Power BI User Group Switzerland. And today I want to talk about Power BI internals and share with you some best practices to keep your 
data model size in optimal condition. I believe it's quite important topic from many perspectives. So I really hope that you will enjoy this session and get some useful takeaways uh, once we are done. Uh, before we start, uh, let me just briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Nikola Ilic. I'm originally from Belgrade in Serbia, but for the last uh, five years, something more than that, I live in a wonderful city of Salzburg in Austria. Uh, I'm working as a manager analytics in Avanad, and living in Salzburg was the reason why I've chosen my nickname, Data Mozart. I guess you know that Salzburg is uh, worldly famous as a birthplace of uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Uh, therefore, I was brave enough to use his last name as, as part of my nickname. And that's why my motto is make music from your data. Uh, you can find me on the web. I'm regularly blogging at data mozartcom I'm also active on social channels, LinkedIn, Twitter, so feel free to ping me or connect if you like. Uh, I have multiple years experience working with different data products, predominantly SQL Server, Microsoft Data Platform, uh, Analysis Service, Multidimensional Integration Services, and uh, most recently, if you consider last four years as recent with Power BI. Uh, I'm also a uh, Microsoft Data Platform MVP, uh, Microsoft Certified Trainer and uh, authoring some courses on Plural Site. Privately, father of two kids and true football and Barca fan, as you can conclude looking at the photo on your screen. So what should you expect today from this session? Uh, well, I like to tell stories, so don't expect a normal session today. I want to tell you a kind of a story, and this story will be about uh, our favorite tool called Power BI. And in my story, you will be a real hero, and our villain is the non-optimal data model size. As in most stories, heroes win in the end, so you will see how to overcome uh, challenges brought to us by the evil data model and resolve different issues along the road, and finally, make your Power BI development a real fairy tale. Therefore, make yourself comfortable, grab a coffee or some other refreshment and listen carefully to this story. So I guess you all know the story about Titanic. If you don't know, you should definitely watch the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet. Wait, what? Yeah, <laughs> you've already watched it. I mean, who hasn't? Uh, Titanic was the most powerful, most beautiful, the largest ship of all time. But the Titanic story ended practically almost before it started. After only four days, uh, in the early morning hours uh, in April uh, 1912, Titanic hardly hit one of the many icebergs in the Atlantic Ocean. And at first look, it didn't seem like something that can transform uh, the greatest engineering achievement of all time into historical tragedy. However, Titanic didn't sink because it hit the tip of an iceberg. Uh, the main culprit was under the surface in the cold ocean water. Now you're probably asking yourselves, what is this man talking about? What the nerd story of Titanic has with Power BI? But if we think a little deeper, we can think of Power BI as an iceberg in the cold ocean's water. And tip of an iceberg is your Power BI dashboard or the report itself. I mean, doesn't that look beautiful? Like a snowy mountain straight in the middle of the water. But the real thing is under the surface, the biggest and strongest part of this iceberg, which provides stability and steadiness of the visible part. And this part underneath consists of multiple individual, but still cohesive parts, which enable uh, above the surface part uh, to stand strong and shine. As I said, there are multiple individual portions down there. And if you stop and think for a moment here as a Power BI developer, you will see different concepts, uh, architectures, and techniques that make your Power BI dashboard shine. If you don't understand and apply those concepts on the right, such as data profiling, data modeling, and data shaping in a proper way, of course, your Power BI report will experience the same fate as Titanic. Same goes if you don't dedicate uh, deserved attention to architectures and techniques on the left. Always keep in mind that all these but also many more core concepts are what enable your Power BI dashboard to perform in most optimal way. Therefore, never underestimate the importance of understanding all those invisible things under the surface. Uh, today, we will focus on learning and understanding the Vertipak engine, but as I said, you should also spend your time learning other key concepts uh, listed here. In the end, 
you can create Power BI reports that work without knowing these underlying concepts at all. But there is a huge difference between Power BI reports that just work and Power BI reports that work efficiently. Now, in order to follow the story, uh, you need to have some skills before you start. Uh, for example, you can't read book in Chinese if you don't know Chinese. So we are talking about prerequisites. And in regard to this session prerequisites, I will I need to stress a few things. First, this is a 300 level session, which means advanced level. So it assumes that you have some not just basic, but let's say intermediate knowledge and experience with Power BI and data modeling in general. And that being said, I expect from you to have at least basic understanding about relational databases, their structure in terms of how the data is being stored in the database and of course to be able to distinct between rows and columns. Of course, knowledge of Power BI is also necessary uh, to follow along because I will often refer to some things related to a Power BI development that I assume you are familiar with. So as we agreed that I'm telling you a story, I mean, we didn't agree, but I hope that you are fine with that. Uh, I've intentionally avoided called, calling this part agenda. Instead, let's think of it as contents of the book. So what's in for you today? Uh, we will learn what is a VertiPack, uh, how it stores the data, what kind of algorithms VertiPack applies to compress the data, and how we as Power BI developers can help VertiPack to build an optimal data model for us. Finally, we will need to leave our book on the shelf shortly, pick our toolboxes, go out, get our hands dirty and dig deep under the hood of Power BI. Uh, during the demo, I'll show you a real life example how I managed to reduce Power BI data model uh, by whopping 90% just by sticking with a few basic but extremely important rules that we will uh, examine today. So here we are, uh, once upon a time in a far, far away land, I'm just joking, my story doesn't start like that. Uh, my story starts with a simple question. Have you ever wondered what makes Power BI so fast and powerful when it comes to performance? And when I say powerful, I mean that it's able to perform complex calculations over millions or even billions of rows in a blink of an eye. Uh, maybe you wondered but couldn't find the proper answer. Uh, perhaps you were just seeing the tip of an iceberg. So today we will discover what is under the surface. And once we are done, I hope that you will get a better understanding uh, and appreciate the importance of creating an optimal data model uh, in order to get maximum performance from the Power BI engine. So going back to our starting point, what is a worthy pack? Again, you will need to wait for an answer. Uh, before we come to it, we should mark the line between row store uh, versus columnar databases. Uh, worthy pack is a columnar database. As you can see in this illustration, Columnar databases uh, store and compress data in a whole different way compared to traditional row store databases. Uh, columnar databases are usually implemented in large analytical systems as they are optimized for vertical data scanning. This means that every column has its own structure and is physically separated from other columns. Another important distinction in order to understand what is VertiPack is to understand the difference between formula engine and storage engine. Uh, as you can notice in this illustration taken from the book Definitive Guide to DAX uh, from Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari, Formula Engine uh, takes the request, processes it, and generates the query plan before finally executes it. Then Storage Engine pulls the data out of the tabular model to satisfy this request uh, issued within the query generated by the Formula Engine. Storage Engine can work in two different ways in order to retrieve requested data. Uh, VertiPack, which is the number one, which will be our uh, focal point of, of our talk today. So VertiPack basically keeps the snapshot of the data in memory. And this data snapshot can be refreshed from time to time from the original data source. On the other hand, direct query doesn't store any data. It just forwards the query straight to the data source for every single request. Uh, we will also mention direct query today, but without going deep into details. So let's talk first about Formula Engine. Formula Engine represents the brain of Power BI. Uh, and as I already mentioned, Formula Engine accepts the query. And since it's able to understand DEX uh, and MDX, by the way, it translates DEX to a specific query plan. Uh, and that query plan consists of different physical operations that need to be executed in order to get results back. Those physical operations can be joins between multiple tables, uh, 
aggregations, uh, filtering conditions, and so on. It's important to know that formula engine works in a single threaded way, which means that requests to storage engine are always being sent sequentially. So let's go and reiterate once more through the whole process that uh, happens within the formula engine. So the first step is that formula engine accepts the request, then it will process this request. Next in the line is generating query, uh, query plan for this request, and finally it executes the generated query. Once the query has been generated and executed by formula engine, then storage engine jumps into the scene. Uh, and since it physically goes through the data stored within tabular model, which is VertiPack database, or goes directly to a different data source, uh, like SQL Server, for example, if you're using direct query storage mode, we can think of storage engine as the muscles of Power BI. When it comes to specifying storage engine for the specific table, there are three possible options to choose from. And those three options are import mode, direct query mode, and dual mode. We will talk about each of them uh, very soon. As opposed to formula engine that doesn't support parallelism, storage engine can work asynchronously. So let's first briefly introduce import mode, which is the most common way to store the data when working with Power BI. That being said, uh, import mode is based on VertiPack, and table data is being stored in memory as a snapshot and data can be refreshed periodically from time to time. Uh, frequency of data refresh depends on your business needs. It can be per hour, once per day, once per month. So it, it's, it's really, uh, it really depends on your specific use case. Uh, when using direct query mode, data is being retrieved from the data source at the query time. And that means that data lives in its original source before during and after the query execution. Finally, dual mode is just a simple combination, represents a simple combination of two first two options, import mode and direct query mode. Uh, data from the table is being loaded into a memory, but at the query time, it can be also retrieved directly from the data source. Uh, okay, so as we have drawn a big picture previously, let me explain now in more detail what VertiPack does in the background. Uh, to boost performance of our Power BI reports. Uh, when we choose import mode for our Power BI tables, VertiPack will perform the following action. First, it will read, it will go and read the data source and transform data into a columnar structure, like you saw in the illustration uh, at the beginning of the session. Then it will encode and compress data within each of those columns. After that, it will establish dictionary and index for each of the columns. Next, it will prepare and establish relationships. And finally, it will compute all calculated columns and calculated tables and compress them. So as you may recall from the previous part of our session, two main characteristics of VertiPack are that it's a columnar in-memory database. And uh, VertiPack applies different types of compression to each of the columns independently. So it, it will not go and compress uh, each of those columns using same algorithm. Depending on the values in the column, VertiPack will choose optimal compression algorithm for that column. Uh, compression is being achieved by encoding the values within the column, but before we dive deeper into a detailed overview, just keep in mind that this architecture is not exclusively related to Power BI. Uh, in the background, is a basically is a tabular model which also uh, works under the hood of analysis services, tabular and Excel power pivot. Uh, OK, so let's now examine the encoding types that VertiPack applies in order to compress our data. Uh, first one is value encoding, then hash encoding or dictionary coding, and finally RLE, which is abbreviation of run length encoding. Uh, now we will go into more detail regarding each of these encoding types. Value encoding is the most desirable uh, encoding type since it works exclusively with integers and therefore requires less memory than, for example, when working with text values. How this looks in reality? Let's say we have a column with uh, containing number of phone calls per day and the value in this column goes from 4000 to 5000. So what the VertiPack will do, uh, it will find the minimum value in this range, which is in our example 4000 and set this minimum value as a starting point. Then it will go and calculate difference between this value 
and all the other values in the column, and it will store the difference as a new value. Uh, at first glance, if you take a look at this example, we managed to save three bits per one row uh, using this technique, and three bits uh, per value might not look like a significant saving, but just imagine that this table has, I don't know, 100 million rows or even billions of rows, and multiply this with three bits per row, and I think you will appreciate the amount of memory saved. Next is hash encoding, and this is probably the most used compression type uh, by Vertipack. So using hash encoding, Vertipack creates a dictionary of distinct values within one column, and afterward replaces real values with index values from the dictionary. Again, let me show you example. It is it is uh, much easier to uh, understand. So as you may notice, Vertipack identified distinct values within the subjects column, built a dictionary by assigning indexes to those values and finally stored index values as pointers to real values. I assume that you are aware that integer values require less memory space than text, so that's the logic behind uh, this type of data compression. Additionally, by being able to build a dictionary for literally any data type, we can say that Vertipack is practically data type independent. And this brings us to very important takeaway. Uh, no matter if your column is of text uh, or float or big integer data type, from Vertipack perspective, it's the same. Uh, in each case, Vertipack will create a dictionary for, uh, for those columns. And that implies that all these columns will provide the same performance, both in terms of speed and memory space allocated. Of course, by assuming that there is no big difference uh, between dictionary sizes uh, between those columns. So, uh, Technically, it's a myth that the data type of the column affects uh, its size within the data model. On the opposite number of distinct values within the column, which is known as cardinality, mostly influence column memory consumption. Finally, third algorithm, uh, run length decoding, or let's call it RLE, uh, creates a kind of mapping table containing ranges of repeating values, and that way avoiding to store every single repeated value separately. Again, taking a look at example will help to better understand this concept. Uh, in real life, Vertipack uh, will not store these start values that I put here. Uh, this is just for the sake of clarity, because it can go and quickly calculate where the next node begins just by simple summing previous count values. OK, so but as powerful as it might look at first glance, uh, RLE algorithm is highly dependent uh, on the ordering within the column. So if the data is stored the way you see in our example, so we have here a many repeating values, then uh, next value begins and again repeating. In those situations, RLE will, will perform great. However, if your data buckets are smaller and rotate more frequently, then uh, run length decoding would not be an optimal solution. And one more thing to keep in mind regarding RLE, in reality, uh, Vertipack doesn't store the data the, data the way uh, it's shown in this illustration, so it's not 100% uh, in reality. Uh, so first, what will what will Vertipack do? It uh, it will perform hash encoding algorithm and create a dictionary of the subjects, and then apply RLE algorithm on top of it. So the final logic, of course, in its most simplified way, would be something like this. So keep in mind that RLE occurs after hash encoding. In those scenarios, when Vertipack thinks that it makes sense to additionally compress data. So when data uh, in your column is ordered in that way, that uh, RLE would achieve better compression rate than using uh, hash algorithm exclusively. OK, so let's just briefly iterate through the process of data compression for a specific column. Uh, first step is Vertipack will scan sample of rows from the column. If, and if the column, uh, column data type is not an integer, it will look no further and it will use hash encoding. If the column is of integer data type, some additional parameters are being evaluated. So first, if the numbers in this sample linearly increase, Vertipack is smart enough to assume that it is probably a primary key column and it will choose value encoding. On the other hand, uh, if the numbers in this column are reasonably close to each other, so the number range is not very wide, like in our example previously, uh, with four to five phone calls per day, uh, Vertipack will again use value encoding. 
On the flip side, when values fluctuate significantly within this range, for example, between 1,000 and 1 million, then value encoding uh, would not make sense and Vertipec will apply the hash algorithm. However, and this is important also to keep in mind, uh, no matter how smart Vertipec is, it can also make some, some bad decisions sometimes based on incorrect assumptions. So it can happen that Vertipec makes a decision about which algorithm to use based on this sample data, uh, but then some outlier pops up and it needs to re-encode the column from scratch. Uh, let's use our again our previous example uh, with number of phone calls, and let's say that Vertipec scanned the sample and choose to apply value encoding. Then after processing 10 million rows, all of a sudden it found a 500,000 value. It can be an error, whatever. Uh, now Vertipec will reevaluate the choice and it can decide to re-encode this column uh, from scratch using the hash algorithm instead. And that will definitely impact the whole process in terms of time needed for reprocessing. Uh, so here is the list of parameters in order of importance that Vertipec considers when choosing which algorithm to use. First one is already mentioned cardinality, number of distinct values in the column. Next one, data distribution in the column, which means column with many repeating values can be better compressed than one containing frequently changing values. As you already learned, RLE algorithm in those scenarios can be applied on top of hash algorithm. Next is number of rows in the table, and finally column data type, which impacts only dictionary size. Okay, so a uh, few more things that we need to, to understand before we jump into the demo. Uh, first, of, uh, first of those things is relationships. And uh, once the Duck's query has been generated by the formula engine, as I already said, storage engine enters the stage and starts its physical work to satisfy the request. And relationships play a big part in this process. So they enable a quicker transfer of the filter context between related tables. Uh, the most important thing to keep in mind regarding relationships is uh, the higher cardinality of the column that makes part of the relationship, the higher the cost of that relationship is. Uh, when the cardinality of relationship exceeds 1 million, users can notice lower performance in the report. One of the reasonable solutions could be creating uh, pre-aggregated tables with different levels of granularity, so you avoid expensive relationships at the query time. Next, a very important concept, uh, concept is uh, aggregations. Uh, aggregations are nothing more than reorganized versions of the source table. So you can have multiple different tables related to same original table. And by pre-aggregating data on different levels of granularity, we can help storage engine to work faster and scan the data in a more efficient way. Uh, Basically applying different aggregations, we are reducing the amount of, of data, uh, reducing the amount, number of rows and columns. So if you take a look at this example, my raw fact table contains 7,346 rows for chats between July 9th and uh, 10, uh, 2017. Now, if we go and pre-aggregate data and count number of chats per specific subject, my aggregated table will have uh, only 45 rows. So if my users need to analyze data per date and uh, or subject or chat subject, having this kind of prepared table will make uh, storage engines job much easier and it can re retrieve the data much faster, of course. One important thing to keep in mind uh, regarding aggregations they don't have any impact on the, on the optimization of the complex DEX calculations. So they are just enabling storage engine to work uh, more efficiently and reduce the time needed to execute the queries. Uh, also, aggregations work only with native columns from your data model. In other words, you can't perform aggregations on calculated columns. In reality, true to be said, you don't need to apply aggregations on each fact table, of course. Uh, aggregations make sense with Vertipec only for extremely large tables, for example, a few hundred million rows or a few billion rows. Uh, finally, be careful when, when you are using aggregations as uh, each mistake can prove costly later, uh, because if not defined in a proper way, aggregations will uh, produce incorrect results in the report. And uh, in the end, having aggregations require additional effort for data model maintenance. 
Okay, I believe we laid a solid theoretical background for the things that come now. And it's time to get our hands dirty, as I promised, and see how all of this works uh, work in reality. So this demo is based on real use case, which I faced during the last year. Uh, the problem was with the size of PBIX file on the on, on uh, our report server. And file size has dramatically grown since the report had been introduced, and I was involved in trying to find a solution. Before we proceed, I will just stress one thing. Uh, for this demo, I've created four separate PBIX files. Each of those files uh, represents uh, one single stage in the data model size optimization. Uh, why I did that? Uh, because we don't need to work on one single file and wait for Power BI to apply all changes we made uh, during the process. As you probably know, in some cases, it takes a while to reload the data and recreate the data model. So let me open my first uh, Power BI desktop file. I put just a plain card visual showing total number of records uh, in my fact table. Uh, so you can see that data accuracy is not being violated by applying uh, various development steps. So let's go to a model view. I simplified, of course, I simplified data model for this demo. Uh, I have fact chat table showing number of uh, show, containing data about chats performed by customer support department. Uh, and this table has around, I think, 9 million rows. Let me check. So yeah, 9.3 oh, 9 million rows. So it's nothing special in terms of volume. Uh, I mean, Power BI should be able to cope easily with, the, with that. Mm, few, few additional dimension tables, nothing special really. Uh, the problem is that all tables were imported in Power BI as it is without any additional optimization or transformation. So just simply checking table name and import mode. Okay, so to be able to follow what is going on with uh, our data model, I will use DAX Studio. I sincerely hope that you are all familiar with DAX Studio and that you are using it. Uh, for those of you who are maybe not aware, DAX Studio is a fantastic free tool. Uh, created by Darren Gosbell, a guy from Australia. It has a whole bunch of very handy and useful features that I would really need another 60 minute session just to talk about them. In any case, if you're working with Power BI uh, on a day to day basis, you should definitely start using Tech Studio. Believe me, it will make your life much easier. Uh, I can I can launch Duck Studio directly from Power BI desktop if we go to external tools tab. Uh, of course, as a prerequisite, you need to have installed uh, DAX Studio on the same machine as Power BI Desktop, and I will launch DAX Studio directly from here. Uh, okay, let's just do a brief tour of uh, this screen. On the left-hand side here, you can see all the tables from the data model. Now, if you're asking yourself, what are those local data tables? Blah, 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 don't worry, we will come later to explain what is this. Just keep in mind that all your tables will be displayed here. Uh, one of my favorite features within Deck Studio is a VertiPack Analyzer tool that will help us to see the numbers behind our data model. VertiPack Analyzer tool just collects data from various dynamic management views for a tabular model. And you can also use uh, tools like SQL Server Management Studio to query dynamic management views and get exactly the same data but you will probably find it in much more uh, convenient form uh, within VertiPack Analyzer. So if I go to Advanced tab and click on View Metrics, Deck Studio will establish connection to uh, instance of our tabular model, and here I can see all of my tables uh, displayed. There are different numbers here. Let's just quickly walk through them. Uh, cardinality shows the maximum cardinality of the table. This is table size. So just to be clear, all those numbers, so size numbers, are in bytes. So basically, you can see that this table is approximately two gigabytes, uh, takes approximately two gigabytes. Additionally, if I go and click on this small arrow next to table name, I can see all those numbers, oops, sorry, broken down on a column level. So I can immediately spot what are the most expensive columns in my data model. And in my case, those two, date team start, date team start UTC with cardinality of almost 9 million, and both of them taking more than half of gig. So 454 megabytes per column. So 23, almost 
uh, of the whole data, data model database. Now one more thing, uh, if you go to summary tab, you can see the total size of your data model. So total size of your data model uh, is being calculated not just by not just by data itself. It also takes into account relationships, uh, hierarchies and uh, things like that. So uh, our total size is 1.86 gigabytes. So I want you just to remember this number 1.86 gigabytes. This is our starting point. And if you ask me, that really hurts. So let's go back and take a look at our data model. And uh, as I said, we can see the memory footprint of for each of the of our columns. And uh, do I uh, uh, first step in optimizing data model size is to ask yourself what columns do you really need for your reports? Okay. So do I really need chat ID and source ID? I spotted them because they have a cardinality of 9.3 million rows because they contain unique values. Uh, chat ID is just a surrogate key from uh, data warehouse. Source ID is the natural key, primary key from the source system. So in any case, I don't need both of them. I will go and get rid of uh, source ID columns. So let's go back to uh, Power BI desktop, not to file. Let's open Power Query Editor and let's remove this source ID column and see what happens with our data model. So we are starting slowly to, to optimizing it. Okay, source ID, I will remove this column, hit close and apply, and let's wait a few seconds for Power BI to apply those changes. That should not take too much. Exactly, and if we go again to, Power, uh, to Dex Studio, I will click again on View Metrics. And now if we go to Summary tab, it's 1.54 gigabytes. So just by removing one unnecessary column, we saved 300 megabytes of space just by removing this one column. So let's go back to our table and see what else can be removed without uh, violating uh, report itself. Those two columns, which I already mentioned, date TM start, date TM start UTC. Uh, date TM start is just a st uh, time stamp when chat started in its original time zone. And date TM start UTC is this time stamp converted to UTC value. So in any case, and both those columns go to goes to a second level of precision. So in 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 any scenario, I don't need both of them. I will keep UTC so I can easily convert uh, that later within the report itself if necessary. And uh, I will get rid of date team start column. Also, those two columns, uh, referer and session referer, very expensive. They have cardinality more than 1 million. Uh, they are just a bunch of JSON, uh, JSON records imported as it is from database. So it's completely useless for any kind of data analysis without uh, some kind of transformation prior to loading to data model. So I will go and uh, remove those two columns also. Uh, next, uh, also column last edit date, which contains data uh, about when the record was last time changed in data warehouse. Completely useless for, from user's perspective uh, for, for uh, any kind of data analysis. Chat variables, also a bunch of JSON uh, records is imported as it is. So I will go back again to my Power Query Editor and I will get rid of those additional, I think, five columns. Let me check when it when it opens. Okay. Okay, so date team start. As you see, it goes to a second level of precision. I will get rid of uh, date team start. Then uh, the next one I mentioned, uh, referer, session referer. Then also what else we identified last edit date and chat variables. So I'll remove all those columns. Now I have one, two, three, four, five, six columns removed from our data model. Completely useless columns. And I hit close in the apply and let's wait again for Power BI to apply those changes. This time it will maybe take 
20, 30 seconds. When I'm doing these live demos, I'm always praying to demo gods that things work as expected. Sometimes, you know, Power BI desktop can crash or uh, do some other ugly thing to me, but hopefully it will not be the case now. Okay, while we're waiting, if there are any questions uh, so far, I can answer it while we are waiting for, for this to complete. Uh, I actually have one, um, yeah. Dennis here. Um, so you mentioned the aggregation tables. And now last month, Christian Wade um, announced that they have automated uh, aggregation tables. Did you work with them? Do you have any experience how they perform, if they uh, do useless things or if they do good stuff? Not yet. Uh, basically, the idea is to have some kind of uh, machine learning algorithm which will collect data about the uh, most frequently ran queries. And based on this data, uh, Power BI will build automatic aggregations to satisfy those most frequently ran queries. So, so far, I don't know anyone who implemented it. I think that people are still, you know, are cautious with, with those new features, but I have high, high expectations from, from this feature, hopefully in a few months. Yeah, same for me. I also don't know anyone, but I also am curious if it really works and how it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm also looking forward to see this. Okay, so uh, yeah, we are ready. Our data model is ready. If I go again to uh, DAX Studio and click on View Metrics, and uh, let's go now to Summary tab. Now it's 660 megabytes. So we started with 1.86 gigs. Now we are at 660 megabytes. Still huge, but we shrank two thirds si of the size of our data model by just removing few unnecessary columns. And as I said, checking which columns are unnecessary and unused in your reports should always be your starting point when you're performing data model size optimization. Why? Let me show you one example and we will quickly go back to a presentation before we continue uh, our demo. So let's imagine that you are preparing a delicious dinner for your friends. You, you invited them for a tasty pizza, but before you make this dish, you have to prepare the ingredients. So what goes into a, let's call it regular pizza, uh, pizza bread, tomato sauce, uh, ham, cheese, Maybe you need some extra ingredients for some of your guests, such as uh, pineapple, why not? <laughs> Corn or, uh, I don't know, egg, olives, because as a good host, you want to satisfy all your guest needs. Okay, so the next step, you're going to the local shop to buy all you need for your perfect pizza. But while you're walking through the shelves in the shop, you see a beer. Do you need a beer for pizza? I mean, it's always nice to have a beer, but do you need it to make your pizza? Few steps more and you spot a chocolate ice cream. I like chocolate ice cream, I really do. But again, do I need it for my pizza? Oh man, that would be really, really strange, really weird pizza with chocolate ice cream on it. So what is the moral of this pizza story? Uh, you should focus on those and only those things you really need. Uh, Translate it to your Power BI development you should focus only on data your report users really need. Okay, you can put something extra, such as pineapples on top of our pizza, in some circumstances when you think that it would bring uh, additional business value to your report or dashboard, but carefully evaluate if that brings more benefit in the final outcome. I mean, would you buy a whole pineapple and put it all over your big pizza if you have only one guest eating pineapple pizza? Or should you maybe prepare smaller pizza for this one pineapple guest instead without disrupting the, ma disrupting the main dish? I believe that it's always, use it's always useful to keep in mind this pizza comparison when you're considering which data to put in your data model. Okay, so going back to DAX Studio, uh, truth to be said, in our model there are a few more columns that could be dismissed, but let's now focus on other techniques for data model optimization. As you may recall from the previous part of our session, when I was emphasizing the order of importance of parameters that affect the model size, I mentioned that cardinality is number one. So number of distinct values within the column. The rule of thumb is the higher the cardinality of the column, so the more distinct values in it, it's harder for VertiPack to optimally compress data, especially if we are not working with integer values. Uh, there are multiple techniques for reducing the column cardinality, 
the most popular one is column splitting and I just share with you now a few examples of uh, using this technique. So I will now go to SQL Server Management Studio. Uh, let me first show you using division and module operations to reduce the cardinality. So basically we have one column with high cardinality, this one, and we are creating two columns with lower cardinality. This one will have cardinality of one. This will have higher cardinality, but uh, we have uh, less digits here, so we will save a uh, few bits per row again. Again, this makes sense for extremely large volumes of data. If you have nine million rows like me, that doesn't mean that it doesn't make sense to do stuff like this. Then you can split decimal column uh, values on decimal point. This is how it looks like. So we're basically uh, separating values before the decimal point into one column and values after decimal point into a second column. Again, reducing the cardinality. And finally, this one, I think this one is maybe pr uh, the, the, the most frequently used when you are when we are talking about this technique is splitting date and time portion here. So uh, by splitting dates and times, we are reducing cardinality. As you know, uh, the maximum number of seconds in one day is uh, 86,000 and something. So that's the maximum cardinality of this column. Uh, instead of having a few million distinct values, you will you will have uh, lower cardinality here. Uh, just one important remark: if we use the calculated columns uh, to apply data model size optimization techniques, there is no benefit at all, since the original column still has to be stored uh, in your data model at first place before your calculations take place. Uh, basically, optimization techniques should be performed on the source side. In most cases, by writing a T-SQL statement or within the Power Query editor, of course. Keep in mind if you're writing custom T-SQL code uh, to import data uh, to your Power BI data model, uh, keep in mind that you should perform all necessary transformations in your T-SQL logic as the query folding would be broken uh, if you use custom T-SQL query and afterward apply additional transformation steps in Power Query Editor. Okay, so uh, going back to Power BI Desktop next file. The idea here is that uh, uh, we don't need to analyze data on second level. That doesn't make sense. Uh, there are very extremely rare situations when you maybe need to analyze data on a second level of precision. Uh, so what I did here, I just got rid of uh, time portion in my date team start UTC column. Let me show you. Here I just remove time portion, so I kept only kept only date here. And if I connect to DAX Studio from this uh, PBIX file, let's see how it looks like from memory perspective. So again, I will go to advanced view metrics. And if we go to summary, it's now 230 megabytes, 213 megabytes. So just recall, we started with 1.86 gig. So it's approximately 15% from where we started from. Uh, and if I go to my table, Date team start UTC. Now you can see that instead of having almost 9 million distinct values, we have 1,356. So it's almost perfectly compressed. However, I made the one mistake. I didn't check with my users if they need to analyze data on a granularity, a granularity level lower than they. I thought their level will be completely fine, but it appeared that they need to analyze data on an hour level. Uh, so what I did. I wrote a T-SQL query to round uh, starting time to, uh, to round time portion to a starting hour. Uh, here is how it looks like. So basically all chats that started between 30000 and 35959 will be calculated as 30000. And when I imported this data set to uh, Power BI Desktop, I will connect to DAX Studio from here. Let's check how it looks now. View metrics. And if we go to Tabri, 221 megabytes. So it's eight megabytes more than in the previous case, but it's 400 megabytes less than with seconds, with minutes and seconds. Okay, so that was huge. 
and one thing when I look at this table, one thing still bothered me. Chat ID column, this one, which has cardinality of 9.3 million rows. And this is just a surrogate key. Uh, so it's not used in any of the relationships within uh, our data model. And just to be clear, I don't want you to come to some quick and incorrect conclusions. We can't simply remove all those columns with ID in the end. Uh, some of them, such as uh, this one, IP address ID or customer ID or user ID and so on, uh, they are used as foreign keys to our dimension tables and therefore they are part of the relationships in the data model. But the chat ID column, as I said, is just a surrogate key not being used anywhere. Uh, so finally, I asked myself if there would be any benefit if I keep this column uh, in data model and I removed it from data model. And this is our final PBIX file, fourth one. Let's connect to Dex Studio from, from this file and see the numbers now. Advanced view metrics and go to summary 161 megabytes. So I just want you to recall where we started. 1.86 gigs, now we are at 161 megabytes. That's astonishing. So I didn't lie to you when I said that I managed to reduce my data model size by 90%. If you compare our starting point, which was 1.86 gigs with the current 161 megabytes, I will let you do that. And one last thing, one last step to do, uh, we finally came to these strange tables here, uh, is to disable all the daytime options uh, in options in uh, for data load in Power BI Desktop. If you're not aware, uh, when you leave this option checked, it will create a hidden table for every single date field in your data model. So if you have multiple date fields in a table of hundreds of millions, millions of rows, your data model will be bloated with those hidden date tables. What's even worse, these tables search for the minimum and maximum date value in your column and automatically create a date range between minimum and maximum value. So if it happens that you have something like December 31st, uh, 9999 for the current records, which is, which is happening in reality, your automatically created date tables will span until that date, even if you don't have any record in your fact table that matches that date. Uh, of course, working with dates and the importance of having a proper date dimension uh, to support all of your time intelligence calculations is a topic for a separate session. But I just wanted to give you a quick uh, heads up why you should consider disabling auto date time for your Power BI desktop files. Uh, and this is another handy use case of DAX Studio. You can't see these hidden date tables anywhere in Power BI desktop. But once you connect uh, your data model with DAX Studio, you can see them on the left hand side as I, as I show you. If you go to File and Options and Settings and Options, uh, you can disable this on a global level here for data load. Uh, if you disable it here, each time you open a new report, uh, it will be disabled for current file. I will go to Data Load, Time Intelligence and uncheck this option. And one last time, let's check in uh, DAX Studio. Now those tables here are dis uh, disappeared. If I click on View Metrics, we managed to save additional four megabytes. OK, so uh, maybe some of you now think, wait, Nicola, why did you waste our time with all this blah, blah talk about VertiPack, encoding types, uh, cardinality, etc.? What you have just shown us is basically just removal of unnecessary columns, nothing special. And I have to agree you are not completely, but almost completely right. But I also have to, to say that in 95% of cases, when you are performing data model size optimization, simple removal of unnecessary and unused columns will be enough to get your job done, believe me. And as I already mentioned, but it's never enough repeating this. That should be always your starting point when uh, dealing with data model size optimization. In those remaining 5% of scenarios, you would maybe need to pull some more advanced tricks like uh, cardinality reduction using some of those techniques uh, that we saw a few minutes ago with uh, splitting columns and stuff like that. OK, to wrap it up, uh, here is the list of general rules, general rules you should keep in mind when trying to reduce data model size. 
first one again keep only those columns your users need in the report and just sticking with this one single rule will save you an unbelievable amount of space i i i assure you as you've just seen in our demo sticking with this one rule helped us to make astonishing savings always remember pizza comparison uh, try to optimize column cardinality whenever possible the golden rule here is test 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 and if you notice a significant benefit from for example, splitting one column into two or substituting decimal columns uh, column with two whole number columns, then do it. But also keep in mind that your measures need to be rewritten to handle those structural changes in order to have correct, uh, correct results uh, in the report. So if your table is not so big or if you have to rewrite, I don't know, hundreds of measures, maybe it's just not worth splitting the column. As I said, it depends on your specific scenario and uh, you should carefully evaluate uh, which solution makes more sense. Same as for columns, do horizontal filtering. Keep only those rows you need. Uh, for example, maybe you don't need to import data from the last five years, but only two. That will also reduce your data model size. Again, talk to your users, ask them what they really need before blindly, you know, dropping everything inside your data model. Aggregate your data whenever possible. Uh, that means fewer rows, lower cardinality, so all those nice things uh, we are trying to achieve. If you don't need hours, minutes, or seconds level of granularity, simply don't import them. Uh, aggregations in Power BI and generally for tabular model are very important and wide topic, which is obviously out of the scope, but there are some really awesome resources on the web, uh, and I strongly recommend reading a blog series on creative aggregations by Phil Simark on dex.tips. Next, avoid using calculated columns whenever possible. Uh, they are not being optimally compressed. Let's let's call it like that. Instead, if you need to do some calculations, try to push them uh, down to a data source like SQL database, for example, or perform them using the Power Query Editor. Uh, use proper data types. For example, if your data granularity is on a day level, there is really no need to use date time data type for your columns. In those situations, plain date data type will be completely fine. And finally, disable auto date time option for data loading. This will remove a bunch of automatically created date tables in the background. Okay, that was it. I will, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. In case there is not enough time to answer them, or if I don't know the answer, I'll try to collect them and uh, and get back with the answers. I don't see any questions in the chat. So first of all, thank you very much. Or or as we would say, puno puno hvala, Nikola. Nema na čemu. Was really really a great presentation. Um, I don't know. We we have three four minutes left. Um, are there any questions? Otherwise, I would just close the call with uh, one more slide. OK, I'll stop sharing so you can you can share the slide and uh, I'm I'm still here. Uh, uh, someone wants to wants to ask. Feel I free. have a question if there are no other questions. Um, you said that actually the format doesn't really make sense. Uh, doesn't really change or it doesn't really matter what you choose. Um, but for example, for dates, do you usually use dates or date uh, keys like as integer? And how is your experience with performance? Uh, yeah, uh, Alberto Alberto Ferrari did a good video on this topic like a month or two ago, uh, comparing performance between uh, date type and integer type like date key. And there is no big difference almost no difference at all in performance, in memory consumption. Uh, they perform almost the same. It's in milliseconds really for some big, uh, big data models. So the if possible, I mean, I like to use date because it's more readable, more understandable for uh, for others. The, the people who, who comes uh, from relational databases world know about this uh, uh, creating this nat natural key uh, as in, in this form as a year, month, date. But there are people uh, who are working with Power BI that uh, come from different background and it's maybe not so intuitive to them. All right, thank you. You're welcome. 
All right, then let me take over to close the call in the last minute. Uh, just as a reminder for future meetups, uh, all meetups run on a monthly basis every first Thursday, starting from 4 till 6 CET. A CET time, which is a Swiss time in my case. Um, the next meetup will happen therefore on the 4th of November. We do not have speakers yet, so if you wish to, to do a demo, please feel free to reach out to us to, to, um, yeah, to get a slot. And here are some useful links as usual. And with that, thank you very much, especially to the two presenters of today and for all who participated and stayed with us for the whole two hours. Thank you very much and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Oh, there is one more question. I see a, a hand raised. Yes, please. Yeah, it's, it's fine. Uh, a quick question for Nicola here, Rafael. Um, hi, Rafael. Hi. Uh, so the trick to split uh, columns uh, to reduce the cardinality. Um, is it not at some point that you will have to find a balance between saving space uh, um, so Vertipack can be optimized and then between the, the DAX formulas that you have to create to reproduce the same column? Absolutely, absolutely. That's a great point. I think I mentioned during the presentation, uh, it's a, it's a trade-off. So uh, if you're stuck with memory problems and you don't have a, a, another solution than splitting columns, then you have to live with this. But as I said, this is a really edge case. So in 98% of cases, uh, you should not do, of course, uh, splitting columns. Uh, yeah, because uh, the pain later comes uh, with DEX and rewriting measures and everything. Uh, it's not recommended to do uh, in all circumstances. Uh, some of these practices, which I mentioned, are, are general recommendation, like getting rid of, of unused columns, but those uh, advanced techniques like splitting columns, uh, uh, stuff like that, it's really for edge cases when you don't, when you really don't have another, uh, another solution. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you. No more questions from my side. All right, great. Then let me stop here the recording.